when you plan on getting this thing out? Because I'm, uh, I need to get a podcast out soon. And either I can just do one and wait a while to put this out, uh, if that's what you're. I don't want to like, obviously, jump the gun here, or beat you to to uh, you know, we have a, a similar enough audience. Um, oh yeah, well, mo- most people that actually uh, email and and write into me, they all tell me like, you know, oh, I just found your podcast. I always listen to Rutherford's podcast, so I I think uh, our listenership is very similar because they're looking for a. Uh, you know, pretty authentic, no BS sort of podcast. And, uh, you know, the, the people that want a clean one without any swearing, listen to mine. And then oh, if man, they want oh, the fuck. extra, <laughs> oh, there we go. We've already, yeah. you've already done it. Uh, um, well, well, Matt, thank you. Let me just say thank you for, for slicing away a little bit of time on this Friday and, uh, appreciate you coming on the show to, to just chat for a little while, man. I, this is, this is kind of a new element. I've been working with a friend of mine uh, to try and essentially be able to do podcasts with good audio quality and everything over the internet, which I swore I'd never do. But you know, to be able to get people like you, I can't drive out there every you know every week, so it's nice to be able right. to at least do this. So appreciate you coming on, man. Yeah, yeah, no problem. I know the the difficulties with it. I hope my audio is okay because I'm just using a basic you know, computer mic here, but, um, yeah, I mean, yeah. I've tried to interview people and I don't interview people very often. And part of it, cause it's just a pain. I mean, you're there on the other side of the world. They're like a totally different time zone. It's hard to schedule everything. I had to wake up at like three in the morning to try to interview somebody <laughs> in Australia or something. And yeah, it was just kind of a pain in the ass. So I, uh, it's just easier to do it the way I do it, but yeah, of course, it's always good to, uh, to talk with you and I'd love to hear more about the plans you got going on. Ah, yeah. Well, we're getting there. I actually just got my uh, first invoice. Well, the first quote for the the new mainsail and staysail from uh, North Sales. And it's going to be just a, a hair under $9,000 to get those two sales. But, uh, you know, that's the keys to being able to get me back out on the ocean come, you know, probably October, November of this year. So, I at least have a goal and something to aim towards and something to save for, which is always good. Is there a sponsorship involved in that? I mean, 9,000, I guess 9,000 sounds about, I, I also had North sales on my 323 Pearson. I used to work for North sale. I bought the sales before I worked for them. I probably would have saved a little money, but um, that sounds about what I paid. I mean, granted it was some years ago. Are you get? are they helping you much? Uh, yeah. I mean, my, my older brother worked for North up there in Newport for, for a long, long time. And we still have good connections there. And, and one of their big wig sales guys, Eric Wakefield, I've had him on the show before and, you know, he does everything from, he could do a West sale 32 and then he could do, you know, Mirabella five or freaking pie whack it and all that sort of stuff. Um, so he's really, you know, master sailmaker. but yeah, we're trying to figure out if, the our two worlds can sort of combine because they're making this new set of sails out of a recycled plastic material i guess or i'm not sure if it's plastic or not but essentially they're trying to really push for it and we're hoping to be able to kind of collaborate a little between him being able to document the building of these sails and then me being able to document you know fitting them out and then heading out to sea for you know, four or five months and being able to test them out and see how it all goes. So, you know, in this world, it's all about connecting and, and sort of collaborating and all that. Cause mm-hmm. you know, like you and I, everything, every time I did a podcast on your show, my show would grow a little bit more and more as well. And, you know, we're all trying to get sort of funding and get donations and it's all part of it, man. Yeah, well, it's hard to do for sure. I mean, all this stuff is expensive and none of us, well, neither of us at least are are wealthy by any stretch of the imagination. And it's sort of the nature of, of being an explorer, you know, I mean, Amundsen, one of the most successful explorers during the age of polar exploration, was so broke at one point that the country of Norway bought him a house because they didn't want their, because he was a hero. He was like a national hero. He went, he was, you know, the first person through the Northwest Passage. The English were trying for years to get through the Northwest Passage, expedition after expedition, you know, Franklin getting stuck in the ice, people dying, all this stuff. And then Amundsen breezed through it essentially with like seven people 
took him a few years to do it. But anyways, he's this national hero. I think it was before he went to uh, be the first person to get to the South Pole. And uh, yeah, he was mm. he was broke. He had nothing because when you're an explorer, uh, you spend all your money on exploring. You don't ever save yep. money to buy a house. You know, you don't you know, every dollar you have essentially goes to the next thing. And um, and Amundsen, they, 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 you know, he became the first to the South Pole and uh, the, the government of Norway got really mad at him later because he ended up mortgaging the house that they gave him to fund another <laughs> expedition. And they're like, wait a nice. minute. And he couldn't he couldn't pay the mortgage, you know, and he was like about <laughs> to lose his house and be homeless. And then and he's like, look, guy, I mean, we can't let our hero be homeless. So they had to like come in and pay his mortgage for him. It was uh, but that's the nature of it. And with Amundsen, he took it to the most extreme because he was never in relationships. You know, like he was like married to exploration. He never got married, never had kids. There's an yeah. argument that he might never have been in love. You know, I mean, it's hard to say exactly, but uh, it was also a difficult time because people back then, when you got married, you didn't get a divorce. So he ended up Ooh. having, he got with a lot of married women, basically, um, mm -hmm. later in life. And obviously that's not going to work out very well for anybody. Um, but yeah, yeah. I mean, it's always a trick, like, well, how are we going to fund this? And of course, when my, my ocean research nonprofit, it's, it's that sort of amplified because of all the equipment and everything else. But, um, and I'm thinking about, you know, trying to do another big single handed trip at some point in the next few years. And I've got, where, where am I going to get the money? How am I going to buy the boat? How am I going to get, like you said, the sales or rigging or yeah. whatever it is. And, it all starts to to really add up. I mean, for for years after my trip around the world, and that one I had saved for a very long time to be able to do everything by the boat. So I was set for that. And it, you know, originally that was supposed to just be the only trip, and then I was going to basically sell the boat and and move on with life. But you know, I just kind of changed my mind, fell in love with it. But in 2020, 2021, and then even 2022, all those voyages. You know, they were horribly underfunded. Um, and because I was working pretty much up until the point at which I departed, I didn't have as much time as I wanted to to do all the necessary things to prepare the boat. And that was one of the realizations that I had where I was just like, man, I can't do this this way anymore because eventually I'm going to go out there and the boat's going to be, you know, in such bad shape that it's going to sink and I'm going to kill myself out there. Right. And I don't want to do that. So I'm, I'm desperately trying to kind of rethink and, and put the work in and, and do whatever I can, but I, I'm not going to go out there until I actually have the, the right stuff and the new sales and everything feels good again. Cause that's how it was for the trip around the world. I, I was like, okay, I have, everything times two i need for this trip you know except for enough food and whatever but like it's one of those things where you got to be prepared because that that ocean is mean and it does not even know you're out there and we got to make sure we're as good to prepare it as possible yeah i mean i think the best you could do in the ocean is coexist you'll never be able to conquer the ocean you're like these people who might climb a mountain or climb mount everest i have conquered mount everest which is silly but, you know, you can tr you can cross the Atlantic. You, you ain't conquered anything. All you did no. was coexist. And that's the best you can ever do is coexist. And, uh, yeah, we don't belong out there. We don't swim very well. We don't breathe underwater. You know, it's 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 a completely foreign environment uh, that, you know, mammals, some some mammals have evolved to deal with it, like dolphins and whales. But most of us, you know, we, we do not do well. <laughs> Not so. a friendly place. Well, and I, I think it was Knox Johnson who who used to always say, like, you know, you never win the war against the ocean because you always have to leave the battlefield. The ocean's always there waiting for yeah. you. Yeah, that's it's true. true. That's true. It's definitely well, yeah, true. you definitely got to get your boats. I mean, you know, West Sail 32 is a notoriously well-built tank of an ocean-going boat. But, I'm, you know, they can still – you've seen plenty of them that are beat to death. I've seen plenty oh, yeah. in boat yards. They've been sitting on the hard for a decade. They look like they're about to fall apart. I mean, they're still strong. <laughs> I bet if you went inside, it'd be like 18 types of mold in there. The woodwork is probably destroyed, you know. But uh, how how is a boat? I mean, you've you've done a lot of miles. You know, how many miles have you done with that boat since you started? 
Uh, somewhere up in the 70,000 mile range, if not a bit more, I'm not sure. I, you know, I, I stopped keeping track of that stuff a long time ago, but, um, definitely somewhere around there because the only, the only real gauge I like to have that for is the standing rigging to sort of know like, sure. okay, it's, it's definitely time to change that out. But, um, you know, Sparrow had a long life beforehand. Cause she's about, I think next year she turns uh 50 and she sailed the south pacific in her first life with her first owners but then was wrecked in a hurricane somewhere up some river in uh in florida and it actually got lifted up and a piling went right through the hull so that had yeah that had to all be professionally done and this guy basically bought it at auction and he kept it in his backyard for like 12 years thinking he was going to set sail someday and then he never did put it up for sale and I was able to grab it and they did a great job with the repairs with the paint and everything. And obviously I've, I've run uh, sparrow pretty hard in my years for sure. But I've, I like to think that I've taken good care of her. Um, you know, at this point I just ended up ripping out all the, the last of the teak decking that used to be in the cockpit. Cause it was starting to leak through. I haven't found any sort of soggy deck or rod or anything like that i've had to rebuild the mast step there's been quite a bit of work um but you know at this point the only real thing is the sails dude i need that gas pedal and i need them to be you know new enough that i don't have to fix them every time i have to put a reef in and all that sort of because that was what was happening to put a reef in it blows the stitching out and then you end up taking it down below sew it up and then and you know it's not no, safe because you know put yourself in that situation of you've got you've got a massive system coming your way and now it's blowing forty and you're looking at these sails and they're straining and you're just like man if that lets go now it's gonna be a real problem and I want to be able to look at it and be like oh yeah that's gonna hold that'll be fine yeah no absolutely I've always got new sails for every boat I've ever had and a main sail at the very least. Uh, my first yeah. two boats, I only replaced the main sails and I kept the jibs. But every other boat, I, the Pearson, I got full sails, new rigging. I always pull the masts on every boat I, that I own, redo the masts, redo the rigging, get new sails. You know, it's every boat I do that with. Um, luckily, with the, the big research boat, the sails never, the boat had never sailed and it came with three of the four sails that we needed. The jib wasn't there. I had to get a new jib. It was twelve thousand dollars just for the jib on that boat, <laughs> and and that Big was a boat discount. Prices. Uh, I know. And that was. It was supposed to be sixteen thousand. It was supposed to be sixteen grand, and then Olman Sales gave, showed me a little sympathy and and knocked a few bucks off the you know off the price. Um, yeah. Now the sales you're talking about are those Dacron? What are these plastic recycled? Because first off, that sounds cool and that sounds sketchy simultaneously. It's yeah, like, I know, you know. I know, right? <laughs> I, I, I assume it's still like a Dacron or a variation of Dacron. I mean, I doubt it's like a whole well, new material, but I have no idea, you know, like what the hell is that? Let me let me see if I could pull up exactly what they're made of. Um, are they charging? Air- are they more expensive to buy those than just a regular standard Dacron? Uh, I do don't know actually because i i essentially with with my connection there i I basically said you know whatever you recommend because he knows he's followed my journeys he knows where i go and what i try and do and and the the long distance aspect of it you know being out for four or five months at a time so it's not like i can bring it to a sail maker um no you need new sales called absolutely it's called uh, NPL Renew, HM Renew. So I don't, yeah, I don't know. I'd have to. I'm, I'm sure if if things go through, Eric and I'll hop on a podcast again, and we'll just talk about right. what these are made of and how they're made and stuff. And but yeah, they are I, yeah, recycled material. I think it's great that they're doing it, you know. And I'm, I'm sure. I mean, North Sale is top of the line, so I'm sure that. Nor sale, you know, the, whatever this is going to be is going to be just as good as any Dacron sale, I'm sure. You know, if they can keep the price the same, then that's going to be a lot of motivation for people to buy it, right? If the price is yeah. higher, then you're going to buy the Dacron that's cheaper just because why would you spend an extra one third or something just to be like a minor recycled? Some people would, but you know. Yeah. So yeah, I'd be interested to hear more about it. But how your rigging is okay? You got you don't have 70,000 miles on the same stand in rigging, do you? 
No, no. I replaced uh, just about everything after the first big trip. Uh, so that was the first like 30, 40. I think that probably had 40 or 50,000 miles on it. That was when I went to replace. And now I'm, as I close in on that, like, if I if I was going to head back down to, to Southern Ocean or something like that, I'd probably be looking to replace all the standing rigging before I did that. But, you know, if I'm just going to do the lap around, you know, the North and South Atlantic and all that, I you know, I might eat these words later on. But, you know, the West Sail also, it, there's, the rigging is way bigger than it needs to be. I mean, there's, I've got two right. backstays, I, you know, it's, I've overbuilt that boat so much that uh, I think it can, you know, pass its little expiration date a little bit. Um, not right. that I recommend anybody to do that, but, you know, if you've well, got they, the means. They, yeah, they say with rigging, they say 10 years or 10,000 miles, but I don't think that's true. And I know I didn't mean to wear the rigging company T-shirt today. I just realized that now. I'm like, oh, shit. <laughs> but I just threw it on this morning. But anyways, I did talk. I know the owner of the company, and and it's you can get 30 years. You know, I mean, that's like pushing it, but you can get 30 yeah. years out of standard swedge fitted rigging if it's done right. You know, if it's not banana, you know, sometimes they roll it, they swedge it improperly. But if they swedge it properly, you get a long time out of it. And 10,000 miles is just a random nonsense number it's just I mean, a number no, yeah yeah there's no reason you can't put 30,000 40,000 50,000 on it I think it's the element of time versus wear and tear like my rigging on my boat is 24 years old but the boat had never sailed up until a couple of years ago and obviously time is you know matters when it comes to you know rigging but use also matters you know my sales for that boat are 20 years old or 24 years old also roughly i don't know when they're made exactly but it's something like that but they sat in a bag in a in a basement that was climate controlled the entire time and after 20 years i pulled the sails out they look brand new you know and i've taken them to sail makers and you know they're, they're fine there's nothing wrong with them so yeah. i don't know where that balance is uh where it's like age versus use and and which one you know supersedes the other but I, I imagine you're fine you have a uh, straps right your chain plates are straps on the side of the hull they're not like through the hull yeah yeah they're big old honking stainless steel they're basically like stainless steel plates and right they're yeah they're they're through bolted right to that hull and again the hull is just pure fiberglass as thick as any boat right. out there and oh, yeah. so it, yeah. it's 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 pretty style. And with the West sale, it's actually, it has like a kind of a, a bad history of dismasting because there really? were a few issues. Yeah. With, so it's got the boomkin, you know, the traditional wood coming off the stern. And in the past that, that really was just oh. all wood and it had a big eye bolt in it and that would rot out and then bing, you'd lose the backstay and it would go. So they started adding stainless and they started doing these things, but then the boomkin has the two little whisker stays that go down to the hall right at the water line. And after 15, 20 years, those stainless plates were starting to let go because they were just undersized. But the nice part about a West sale, having so much knowledge from all these past sailors and all this information about it, I was able to go and basically check off all the things that were issues before and just make sure we overbuilt, overbuilt, overbuilt. And I had to get a lot of custom stuff made, but again, you know, if you're heading around the world, dude, you, you better that, that money, uh, you, you don't hesitate to spend it because you're kind of like, well, I might as well spend every single cent or else I might not make it back here. And if I do make it back, then I'll, I'll just go get a job somewhere. That was my it, thinking back then. It's, it's funny how things can dismast you that you don't expect. Like uh, the Pride of Baltimore is a big traditional tall ship. This is actually the Pride of Baltimore too. The first one mm -hmm. sunk down by Puerto Rico and it was a tragic thing. A few people died, but that was a totally different scenario. It had nothing to do with the dismasting. But the uh, second one got dismasted. And what had happened is that, you know, they've got a bowsprit because it's a traditional boat. And you have that bob stay, which is similar to those little whisker guys you were talking about that actually supports, in your case, the boomkin, in this case, a bowsprit a fitting where it, the, the bobstay meets the hull, just some little fitting broke. And that created a chain reaction that ended up dropping the giant mast on this tall ship. And almost, you know, they <laughs> lucky nobody died, but it's just that one little fitting, you know, it's just, yep. it's, that's all it takes sometimes is, uh, is just 
So, yeah, I mean, definitely. I mean, if you're going to be going out, I mean, you never know, too. I mean, I know compared to some of the other stuff you've done, the idea of sailing down to the South Atlantic and, and, and you know, is not as, um, I don't know, difficult or scary or whatever it is. But you never know. I mean, you got you hit by know. a pretty nasty yeah. wave, not terribly far <laughs> offshore. I mean, so and that was nowhere near the Southern Ocean. Right. So, yeah, it, it, no, it's true. It well, and it. In uh, in 2021, that was when uh, I went right through the eye of Tropical Storm Wanda, and that was in November, late uh, mid or late November, I can't remember. Over, I was closer to Africa than I was to the states, and uh, that freaking thing just meandered, and it came it came down from the north, and I was just mm. sitting duck, and you know those are those are the times where that one I hove to. Cause I just, it came in the middle of the night, like it always does. And I was just, I'm going to hunker down. It was blowing maybe like 50 sustained. And, um, those are those times where you're like, you got to really trust those sales and yeah. make sure that, yeah, like you're rigging and stuff. And I have to say, man, before I forget, I still remember, I don't know how many of your podcasts ago it was, it was probably a year or two. Um, but I remember you doing one talking about, just like those little stainless steel tangs that you have on like your mass, you know, mm -hmm. and making sure that like if, if you're at least inspect them, but if it's some little stainless thing and it's been on your boat for 20 years, just replace it. That way, you know, you've got something that's brand new and it doesn't have some hidden sort of fracture in it and stuff. And that, that stayed with me. Well, till today, honestly, like it, it, it was such good, you know, because you, you look over all the stuff on your boat all the time, but then there are those little things like you're talking about with the bobstay that, you know, this stupid little $5 part can fail on you, but your whole rig can come down. So just replace them when you can, you know? Yeah. And, you know, I've been doing this for close to 20 years now. And, and whenever somebody has told me that they've been dismastered or they know somebody that's been dismastered, I always ask them if they know what happened. You know, how, why did, what, where, how did it fall? Why did it fall? What, you know, and more often than not, it was something up high on the mast. People think chain plates because they're down by your feet. You see the chain plates every time you walk up and down your deck. It's safer with your boat because when you have the outside, you know, the big straps or the or whatever. I anything can look outside, at them. Yeah. yeah, that's way. And you don't get crevice corrosion because a lot of the chain plates fail where they go through the deck. You know, it's that like one inch where you know, the stainless gets like water in there. It gets that crevice, the, the lack of oxygen, the crevice corrosion. And you never will see it, you know, so the tangs up high, you just, I don't know, you just don't think about it because they're way up high. And more people yeah. that I have talked to have lost a mast or know somebody lost a mast from a, a failure up top than a failure down on deck. So uh, it happens both ways, obviously. I mean, uh, John uh, Kreshmir was dismasted, I think, last year, and that was yeah. from a chain plate. So that was a, that was what the common chain plate failure scenario. But and luckily it was, you know, relatively close to land and it wasn't in a gale or a storm or any of that kind of stuff. But yeah, I mean, you got to do everything you can because you just don't know. I mean, you're going out still on a big trip. I mean, Randall Reeves, he got damaged, uh, on, broke part of his monitor wind vane. Uh, I think mm -hmm. it was on a second, his second time around on the figure eight. And he was somewhere off the East coast of the United States when that happened, you know, it wasn't, uh, like some big, crazy, you know, body of water that we think of, you know, the Bering yeah, Sea, yeah. Cape Horn, the, the <laughs> Southern Ocean. And he had been through the Southern Ocean on that trip. And he got more damage on that second time around somewhere off the East Coast of the United States, you know, and some wave uh, picked him up. And, uh, you know, his, uh, his uh, Jordan series drogue somehow got wrapped around his wind vane and it got tight. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mangled his wind vane, you know, and, um, and there's ups and downs to say about this drogue versus that. And of course I have opinions on everything, but, um, Oh yeah, you do. I don't even want to get you all heated in that <laughs> I'm discussion. Not, I'm not even going to talk about it. Yeah, I don't <laughs> even talk about it. Whatever. But you know, it is interesting. Randall, uh, I remember chatting with him one time and you know, he's, he's a Pacific guy. He's a West coast sailor. And mm -hmm. he, he had said that on that second figure eight, when he came up, he was like, man, I saw some pretty, pretty scary weather in the North Atlantic around the Gulf stream and stuff. He was like, the waves are just, and he's been in, you know, the Indian ocean where the waves get really bad. That was what happened on his, uh, on his first go round right. is that he got knocked down and it blew out a bunch of his windows and portholes right. or something like that. And, 
And so he had to pull into Hobart. I think that he was out there the same year I was doing my trip around the world. Uh, we just didn't know of each other because, I don't know, neither of us are really uh, – too much on the publicity scene uh now now that's changed a little bit because we're trying to use this platform to fund everything but like you know back then it was like i don't care i'm not even gonna tell anybody i'm just gonna go kind of like yeah. your trip you didn't really do much no. uh it was pretty much like i'm just gonna go around the americas yeah there wasn't much to i mean andy shell was able to get a couple of articles out that's back when he was writing a lot you know, before yeah. he was doing his podcast as much. And this was before he was doing the sailing and buy, selling berths. He was able to get a couple of articles and a couple of magazines before I left, which I thought was impressive because I hadn't even done it yet. You know, I mean, I understand you write an article <laughs> when I get back, but I hadn't even left. So, I mean, that was cool. And I appreciate But when I left Annapolis, there's only one person on the dock waving goodbye. And I sailed out of Annapolis right past all the other boats and nobody had any clue that what I was about to do, you know. So it was a very low key but that trip was you know 309 days and as i continued on it built more and more momentum just because it was such a long trip that it had time to build momentum but you know i think randall reeves is one of the the less known and underestimated you know and randall doesn't want any attention you know which i, no. I pat him on the back for because he's doing it for his own reasons not to be like a famous sailor i do think it's a bit of a shame i don't i don't know not that any of us are doing it for any kind of award but I, I don't know if he got anything, any kind of like award style recognition for what he did. And I think it I think he, not that he cares, but I, you know, I, I just think it's a shame because what he did was really impressive. I mean, I would love to have a whack at the figure eight myself. I'd like to try to do it nonstop. I don't know if that's going to be what my big single handed trip is or isn't. But um, but it's intriguing. And I thought about it going around the Americas. There's a couple of days after Cape Horn where I thought, well, I could just keep going straight and circumnavigate you know, the bottom of the planet and then shoot back up. And I, I looked at my food and I looked at my supplies. I didn't really have enough food and my boat was falling apart. You Your know? boat. So I was going to say, dude, yeah. if you would have gone, dude, there's no way. Oh, no, I know. Been. I would have died. I would have died. <laughs> and that was the realization. I was like, Matt, you idiot. Like, what are you doing? Like you, you, yeah. you better get your ass back up North before you sink. Like you're lucky you made it this far, dude. Just stop it and go, go North. <laughs> and, uh, and luckily the rest of that trip after I had one more storm around 40, but after that, I didn't have too much bad weather the rest of the way up. I mean, I had a little bit of stuff here and there, you know, but, uh, but nothing terrible. So thank God for that. But yeah, man, Randall is the man and, and you can blow a window out. I mean, I'm looking you know, I, I get on yacht world just yesterday thinking about boats. Some of it's dreaming, you know, but I'm trying to find oh, yeah. the next boat for the next big single handed trip. And believe me, that Randall situation he, with his window blowing out and it went all over his nav station. He got salt water on all of his like electronics and fried everything. And I'm thinking about that all the time. I look I'm looking for the boats with the smallest windows, you yeah, know, that, dude. that I would never want to actually cruise on. Like if I was going to sail around the world for pleasure, I would never pick this boat because it's going to be like a dark cave of a metal. You know, <laughs> I'd like to get a metal boat. But it's going to be a tank. You know, I want something you could just throw anything at it. And, you know, who knows? Maybe you lose your rig. Maybe you don't. You, know, you roll the boat enough times or whatever it is. You know, obviously you can lose a rig. But um, but maybe you can build a jury rig and still get back to land, you know, and at least you don't die and the boat can sail another day. But, yeah, it's a totally different concept of the kind of boat you want to get for a big, crazy, you know, ocean single-handed voyage versus – you know, any other type of sailing. Um, and it's well, what do you, can, can I ask you, what, what are your thoughts on the uh, Contessa 32? Cause I know that's Kretschmer's like, that's his go-to as far as like seaworthiness, sea kindliness for a small ocean traveling vessel. And, you know, he, he freely admits though, it's like a cave down there. It's, it doesn't have headroom. It's, uh, you know, if for, for actual living in comfort, it's uh, kind of a nightmare, but have you ever sailed on one? No, I've seen them. I mean, I knew a guy that had one. I, I agree, at least with a pedigree. John has more experience because I think he sailed around Cape Horn on a Contessa 32. Years yeah, ago. backward. I'm, I'm, he went He went from Atlantic to the Pacific. Yeah, and that's when he wrote his first book, I believe, and that kind of jump-started his whole career, I believe, was that that trip, and then the, se the subsequent book he wrote. Um I mean, everything I've heard about Contessas, generally speaking, are good. Tanya Abbey had a Contessa 26. She's arguably the first woman to ever sail alone around the world. 
they kind of took it away from her because she gave somebody like a like a 60 mile trip from one island to the other i think it's the most i think it's complete <laughs> bullshit but it's um only because if you go through the canals like you go through panama canal i've been through panama canal once i can't remember exactly how long it is but it's something like 80 miles or 100 miles or something like that you know it's long enough it's a it's a distance you can't mm-hmm. do that alone. You can't do that single-handed. You have to have line handlers. You have to have four line handlers minimum. It is the law. It, you cannot get away with out doing that. So you have people on the boat for these other stretches. What does it matter if she gave somebody a ride for 60 miles from one island to another if you had people on the boat going through Panama Canal? I mean, I know I'm kind of nitpicking here. But anyways, she had a Contessa 26. Um there's also, I think, a, a 36 I've seen, a Contessa 36. I think I saw a 39 for sale on Yacht World just the other day. I didn't even know that existed. I didn't even know they Those made must that be boat. like custom designed ones or something like that, or just maybe right. the designs are there and you just find a yard that'll build it for you. Because their they're staples are the 26 and the 32, right? That was what the yeah, company Yeah, yeah, those are, those are, I think they made some 36s too, I believe. I think you can find one on Yacht World right now, but... Um, but yeah, man, I mean, that's, that's a famous boat. I mean, I, I would take one, not to give you a hard time, but I'll take a, a Contessa 32 over a West Sale 32. Although I know I think the West Sale 32, <laughs> no, that, if I was, hey, uh, <laughs> if I was going through a st- I think the West Sale 32 is a stronger boat. Don't get me wrong. Like, I think that that is like the ultimate tank of a fiberglass 32 footer. It's just, yeah. it, it, the Contessa is a little more sporty, you know, it's a little yeah. faster. And that's, See, um, well, I will, I will freely admit I, you know, I had just spent, uh, about a week doing sort of consulting, sailing, training, some offshore work with this couple that have the most beautiful West sail in the world, bar none. They had, the guy had Sparks and Stevens come and basically rebuild it from the keel up. And we got out and we just wanted to go around the little Bahama bank, you know, a little five, six day trip. And we had wind on the nose wind chop head seas for like four days and literally we're doing two knots hobby horse and away and you just can't make that boat go to web the bow is so rounded that it just mm. pops off of those waves now granted if you're racing down those waves in a gale it's blowing 40 knots and the seas are getting up in the 20 foot range it's freaking awesome because that you, you never fear burying the nose in the trough you don't fear pitch poling or anything like that but Mm-hmm. it's yeah i mean like you said it's not a sporty vessel you're gonna have to have a lot of patience and know that you're limited in a lot of a lot of ways but you know i always tell people that if if speed were my concern i'd have a different boat but because all i really want to do is sail anyway it doesn't matter how fast i'm going i'm just having fun while i'm out there yeah no i mean west sail 32 is a legendary boat there's no doubt about it and it's it's great southern ocean no, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's, uh, I mean, it was one of the first boats. It was, you know, I don't know when it, when did they design it? Was it the late 60s? Because I know in the 70s was kind of the heyday. It was a Bob Perry design. Uh, I, 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 all I know is, like, I've always heard Atkins, Archer, something like that. It's based off the old, like, Norwegian lifeboats, you know, that double-ender sort of style. And then... They the first one they came out with was like a flush deck version called like a Kendall 32. And that was back, I believe, in the late 60s. And then they added the cabin trunk on and all that sort of stuff. And uh and the West Sale 32 was born. What, but was that a Bob Perry design? Was that was Perry part of that process? I thought Bob Perry, I thought it was like the early, early, early days of Bob Perry. Uh, was it, it could be. Was I unfortunately, oh, you're 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 there's you're something called my, a, uh, ignorance ha, have, here. I have, have no you ever idea. Have, you, have you heard of a Sarah 32? So there's uh, not many of them. That that was a I Chuck have heard Payne. Of that. Yeah, I sold one once when I was a yacht broker. It's a Chuck Payne design. So Chuck Payne tried to make a boat to compete with the West Sail 32 called a Sarah 32, and uh, it was just it was a beautiful Chuck Payne is you know he's one he's like. I don't know, Picasso or something. But you see somebody that you don't hear about as much as somebody like Bob Perry. But he's, yeah. I mean, he did a lot of the Morrises, the the the, uh, the Apache, uh, Able Apache 50. Um, the guy has done a ton. He did some stuff with um, uh, Bowman, some of the more modern Bowman lines in the early 2000s. But anyways, the problem with the boat was it was too expensive. 
Like it was a hell of a boat, but he couldn't compete with the West Sail well enough because it just cost too much money to buy one. So West Sail, you know, West Sail had that thing where you could get it as a kit. You could get a yeah. factory finish. You could get it all back in the seventies. A lot of boats did that. The uh, Corbin did that. Corbin thirty nine. You could finish it yourself, or you could have the factory do it. Now, what they can you imagine buying a Beneteau that isn't finished? Like, you imagine <laughs> anybody doing that? Like, you yeah, know, with right. people who are handier back in the day, people, like, I will build my interior. You know, nowadays they, they wouldn't even imagine where to start. Like, you know, to, <laughs> so it was a different era of boat building essentially back then. And uh, well, there, the you know. Boats now are just so freaking complicated. They have so much tech and so much wiring and all these different things. And, you know, when you go through a West sail, I'd love to see a West sail that was, you know, never touched, never modified from the factory and see how basic and sort of bare bones. Cause even though they're like heavily built, they were never known for like, their wonderful joinery and fine teak work and stuff like my, my old man, he's been on, uh, he's been on Sparrow twice offshore. And he, he always says it sounds like a popcorn maker down below. So every <laughs> joint is just like, pop, 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 pop. <laughs> but yeah, you, you know, I, to it though. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you definitely do. But dude, you know, what's kind of weird. I, I asked you this cause you've spent enough time out there, you know, when those, there's like noises that you can totally put up with, but then there's noises that you absolutely, or at least I can't, i.e. trying to isolate the one stupid, like, you know, can of tuna that is moving a half an inch and then banging up against the bulkhead and searching for hours and hours. The question I have is how come I can put up with listening to, you know, the sail slatting for 36 hours. But if that one stupid little can is moving, it just, it won't even let me sleep. I must find, I must seek and destroy. Does that ever happen to you? Oh, a hundred percent. I mean, it, it happened to me the point where I will tear a boat apart to find whatever <laughs> the hell that thing is making noise. So the way I've always looked at it is there's noise that I can control and there's noise that I can't control. And the noise that uh... I can't control, it becomes white noise. Like, I don't even really hear it. You know what I'm saying? And there's a lot of it. There's like my boat, like they would the open Vega, for instance, would creak and crack and moan and groan and all sorts of different noises. Right. But if, yeah, if there's that one can or one, whatever, and I'll, it'll be on the same on a delivery, it'll be the research boat. It doesn't matter if I can, if there's something that I can control, it will drive me insane <laughs> if I can't find it. And I will spend hours. I'll, I don't care, you know, cause it will, it becomes like a fixation of, and yeah. it doesn't even matter. Who cares if the can of tuna is rolling around? It's not going to hurt anything, <laughs> you know? But I also think it's really good that we're in tune with our boats that way because I've always yeah. thought that that sound is an underestimated part of, you know, people think a lot about the eyes and about looking at this and looking at that. But you can tell so much about your boat by the sound it's making. And when you know the noises that it's supposed to make or it normally makes, and any little noise outside of that you hear, you know, it becomes the only thing you hear and then you can fix it quicker or maybe you can try to get on top of it before it breaks or whatever it might be. But I think it's it's absolutely critical not just to know with your eyes, know your boat. Well, there's like three things, you know, your boat with your eyes, you know, your boat with your ears and you know, your boat with your your body. Essentially, I also think that just like laying down on a set tee, like you're single handed, you're in the ocean, you go down inside lay down on a settee, close your eyes and just lay there and feel the boat. And you yeah, can get a lot yeah. of information. Uh, is the boat happy? Is it, is it overpowered? Is it underpowered, you know, over canvas, under canvas. You can tell if you change course, you can tell how fast you're going by the sound of the water going past the hull. Like you, you can get to really know your boat uh, just by the feel, just like becoming one with the boat, laying down and just feeling the boat. In some ways, I think your eyes almost are less important than those other two factors. Cause I mean, seeing something's obviously important, but, but knowing the sounds and knowing the feel of the boat, it, it becomes an extension of your body. And you've spent enough time on your boat that it, it becomes like your left arm, you know, your boat oh, is yeah. part of you. And, and if your boat's hurting, you're hurting, you know, and if your boat's happy, you're happy. It, it, you know, you become the boat and the wind becomes your, you know, if you, if the boat is your right arm, then the, the, the wind becomes your left arm. You know, and and you just become. Uh, granted, once you spend too much time out there, you get all like, yeah, you know, right. Zen. <laughs> I'm, I'm I'm one with the ocean, man. 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, you oh, do. You yeah, become man. one with the ocean. It, it, it happens. It's his whole. That's part of has- the part of the fun of it, though. I think is it, and it, it usually takes a couple weeks for me. But when you get into that mental state where you know your your connection isn't being severed anymore. It's you, the boat, and the world around you. And I, I always get asked this at all my presentations. I did one yesterday and still get the same question of, like, why would you do that? Why would you go out there by yourself? And I always try and explain how, you know, you, you pull away from the land, and then after enough time goes past, your whole brain, all your, your senses heighten, but your brain slows down. And I always equate it to, Kind of like, you know, when you're a little kid, you can lay on the grass and watch the clouds go by for like hours, totally content. No big deal. This is great. That's how I end up finally getting into that headspace while I'm out there. But if I had another person on board, that connection would constantly get severed with, you know, conversation and this and that. And how's that person doing? And how am I treating them? And man, I'm annoyed by that and blah, blah, blah. When you have that that just personal connection where it's just you, the boat, and the ocean, man, it's something special. And it, it's impossible for me to really share what that's like to anybody who hasn't done it. But, you know, your brain just kind of – it. I, I don't want to say it evolves out there, but it definitely shifts gears. Yeah, it's not – I mean, it just it, – generally speaking, exploration is a hard thing to explain. The The drivers, like the personal drivers behind it – you know, the old famous uh, Sir Edmund Hillary, the first guy to ever climb uh, Mount Everest. Uh, of course, yeah. he did it. He did it with a Sherpa, by the way, who I'm sure helped. Yeah, Lopsang, man. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and there was a great movie that completely there's a, there's a documentary on Netflix about some other guy who climbs like nine, eight of the highest mountains in 21 days. And he's a he's a guy from Nepal. It's it's amazing with the guy. Oh, comes. yeah. What yeah. yeah. Is that um, Do you know what you're talking about? I know exactly which one you're talking about, but yeah, he goes. And it's and he all, climbs. it's not a bunch yeah. of white guys. It's a bunch of like dudes who are Sherpas and Nepalese and these guys just crush it. I mean, they make the, 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 they make the, the Western dudes just like, you know, I mean like nothing, they just blow through this. And I'm sitting there like, how the hell, like they'll be on K2 one day and the, and the next mountain is almost as tall as K2 48 hours later. Like, how do yeah. you do that? Like, how is that even possible? Know. But, but anyway, Sir Edmund Hillary climbed Mount Everest and they asked him, right? Why would you want to do this? And he said, because it's there, which was sort of the famous answer, which is a half ass answer, obviously. But there's a lot more to it. And, and why would anybody want? Why would Shackleton want to walk across Antarctica? You know, why did why would any why did Franklin want to go through the Northwest Passage? There's why are people going to want to go into outer space in the future when we have technology is going to allow us to explore outer space? The early years of it is going to be long. It's going to be d- dangerous. You know, you're putting yourself through all sorts of difficulties. Why would people purposely remove themselves from the comforts and luxuries of civilization and put themselves in these difficult and dangerous scenarios? It's hard for most people to wrap their mind around, but it's a drive that exists and it probably exists in everybody at some level or another. But in some people, it's, it exists stronger than others. And I think it's important for our species to have uh, a people out there pushing the edges of exploration, because, I mean, how did we spread all over the planet? You know, it, it's from early, early yeah, explorers who out. came out of yep. Africa. And, and and those guys were explorers, too, that the people that crossed over the land bridge into uh, uh, Alaska and, and inhabited the Americas. Those were explorers. People in Australia. I mean, all those guys. So, I mean. The Polynesians back in the day on their little uh, boats going across the Pacific with no compasses, you know, I mean, and we're going to need that spirit when it comes to the next frontier, which is space exploration. Space, if yeah, that is the next frontier of exploration. We're not there yet. If if you and I could, we'd probably be out there doing it. I know I'd be flying around in outer space if I could. You know, we're just. Oh, it's my not ex- God. Yeah. Kidding me. Yeah, it's, it's, they could use us. As so, you know, you, are you familiar with that? That solo sailor Reed Stowe? He's the one who. Uh, oh yeah, yeah, a thousand days at sea and, and yeah. so on. Yeah, yeah, I know. Well, Reed I, got a I lot think... of shit, and I think he didn't deserve it. I think Reed. I no, like he Reed definitely did. didn't. And the sailing anarchy, not all of them, but they gave him. There's some people in sailing anarchy really. Uh, they were like stalking him. You know that, that when his girl got pulled off, she went to an airport, and there's people at the airport waiting to like g- give his girl a hard time because she was on the boat with him for like. Uh, six or seven months or something like that. Yeah. yeah, Like taking it to like crazy ass levels, hating on this guy. 
And you know what he did was he was doing definitely his thing out there. Yeah, let, yeah. The guy want to spend a thousand days out there? Go be good. Go for it. You know. <laughs> but but anyways, well, I know Reed is also like I would do yoga and I'd look out in the ocean and I'd cry out of joy and you know he was yeah, very like you yeah. know along those lines, which is cool. Con- I mean, that's what. You, Kind of like Morticier a little bit in in some respects, I guess. But but yeah, I mean, back to your point though, it's it's like yeah, why would why would Rutherford want to go around the Americas? You know, you got to add yourself to that list, by the way, because uh, you definitely have that. But um, you've read A Voyage for Mad Men, right, Peter Nichols, about the uh, first yeah. uh, Golden Globe. Yeah, and the, the my favorite documentary of all time is a uh, Deep Water. Deep which was water, the, B- yeah, the BBC yeah. documentary about basically the same story. It's just the BBC's version of it, you know, through documentary. Um, but yeah, no, well, that's one of the. Sorry, I didn't interrupt. One, one of the no, things no. that that the author talks about is something he calls the Ulysses factor, and essentially, it's the same thing that you're talking about, where there's a very small sect of people of humans that have this this thing inside of them that decides that you know what they want to do and what they're going to pursue are these massive grand very dangerous challenges they're going to go out there and they're pretty much going to do them on their own they're going to separate themselves from society and then they're going to return and share their experiences share what they learned their knowledge all that and usually then within enough time they're going to have to go again so i think it's one of those things where People like you and me, people like Randall Reeves, I'm sure Bernard Mortissier, like these, there's, there's this like glitch in our brain that says, you know, we're, I'm supposed to go do this. My life will be better if I go do that, but I'm going to come back, but then I'm probably going to go again. I mean, I, do you see yourself ever not kind of wanting to go back out at sea alone for a nice long trip? Well, I mean, I'm trying to put it together right now. I've been trying to put it together for years. I mean, I, you know, the nonprofit is is my priority. Um, I, well, but you know, like I, 20, 30 years from now, when when you know when we're in our 60s and 70s, you think you think it's just going to still be like this itch that we always have to scratch? I mean, it might sound crazy, but if I live old enough and I find out I got cancer or something, I, I want to go out there alone and die out there alone. You know, that'd be like a yeah. beautiful death to be is to go out there. I don't know if I'd pull the through hole. I have no idea how I would do it. Maybe I'd just drift around. Maybe someone will find me. But but no, I mean, you never. It, it The problem with a lot of this is it doesn't go away. You know, like you did your first yeah. trip and you thought like, oh, I'm going to do a, this trip and then I'm going to be done with this trip and then I'm going to move on and do something else. And and it just gets deeper and deeper into your into your bones. And and it, yeah. You, all you want to, you know, you just want to do it more and more in some ways. So no, I mean, I would, I don't know what things are going to turn out in the future. And I know it, you know, your body doesn't help in some ways, you know, as you get older, it doesn't get easier. But then again, I mean, Knox Johnson has done some badass stuff when he was, you know, recently, and he's not a young guy. And uh, he did like a 4,000 mile single-handed race and came in, I don't remember what, he came into one of the, you know, the top positions. And uh, isn't he pushing like 80 years old or something? Oh, easily do that. But that dude's legit, man. He is, he is, uh, I know he's a beast. He's, he's a, beast, a whole man. different level, dude. Whole and different then there's level. a guy, John, God, there's a guy, John, something or other. He sailed alone around the world like 10 times. I think he has the record. John Sanders. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. John Sanders. And I mean, that well, guy he was did doing it, it when he was getting older. He did it three times in a row going east to west, then west to east then east to west again. Or no, yeah, it, the other direction, something like that. But he did that, and I think he still has the record. It's like 600 and something days, 645 days, I think. It's crazy. Yeah, well, next to, the, to um, uh, Reed. To uh, Reed, uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, he did a thousand. But Reed was just hanging out for the most part. He did, he did a little bit of stuff. He wasn't going around and round and round. And John, then, uh, yeah, uh, he was Southern uh, Ocean. Uh, uh, Socrates was a Jean Socrates. She uh, she w- oh. was the oldest woman that she sailed around the world. And she was like 79 or something when she sailed around yeah, the world nonstop yeah, yeah. single-handed. And she had a few attempts. I think she got in a storm off of Cape Horn. I think she had a Naja. Naja? Was that, how do you say that boat? N-A-J. It's a Scandinavian boat. Naja. Something like that. It looked Sounds like right. a Holberg Rossi. But, um, but anyways, she, um, you know, so, yeah, I mean, why? I'm never going to stop. You know, I mean, I'm, I, I, I'm it's too much in my blood, but I, I don't want to just do that either. That's why I started the nonprofit, you know, cause 
at the end of the day, it's, it's meaningful to a degree, but only to a degree. And, and a lot of it's personal. Like you do these big single handed trips for personal reasons. You're not doing it to save the world. You know what I'm saying? Right, it's like right. you're doing it because of your own drive, your own desire. You know, it ain't about fame. Otissier said something about, you know, if you're doing it for fame, you'll never succeed. You know, you have to have, you have to have a deep personal reason because it's going to get really tough and it's going to get dangerous brutal. and you have to be able to, yeah. And you got to push through that. And if you don't really want it for deep personal reasons, you're going to break and you're going to quit, you know, it's, uh, or you're going to freak out in a storm or whatever it's going to be. So yeah, you got to have the, the, and that's fine. Like there's, there's hopefully if you live long enough, there's enough time in life for all this, right. There's enough time to go cruising in the Bahamas for the winter and just, kind of hang out and go snorkeling you know there's time to go single-handed around the world there's time to sail around the world and stop in ports there's time to do research there's time to do you know trying time to do all of it you know hopefully yeah but you never never want to count those chickens before they hatch well why matt as we get close to like the uh we're we're almost at uh 50 minutes or so right now i i do want to um if you could, if you could just chat a little bit about the upcoming second half of this uh, data Uh-oh. collection and am, research am okay? you're doing, you're you're breaking up. Am I okay? Uh, yeah, you're okay. I mean, we'll see in in post op. I'll be able to take a look at it, but it seems all to right. be all right. Yeah, I can hear you. Don't worry about. It. I can. You get those right. glitches, but if you could just take a, a a little bit to talk about the the data collection and the plastic stuff you're doing in Chesapeake, that'd be awesome, man. Yeah, so it's it's coming up in, uh, in a, less than a week. Um, it's been taking a lot of my time recently. It's it's funny how much stuff you got to do to get a boat ready, even for a, uh, 850 miles in a Chesapeake Bay. Um, yeah. You know, I mean, I've done like three sea trials already on the, on that boat, and I'm going to do another one later today because I've been having issues with this. It's the boat just kills itself. I don't get it. I parked the boat in the slip in December and all this stuff works. And then I took the boat out like a week ago or two weeks ago. And it's like all these different things, like where, why, how is this broken? Like, how is the autopilot not working? It worked fine three months ago. I haven't done anything to it. But anyways, the, um, this is part two of a project that, that we, we did part one back in uh, the fall, back at the end of October. And we are looking for microplastics, particularly microfibers, because that's a kind of uh, uh, microplastics that you get in the Chesapeake. You don't get what I would call oceanic microplastics, which are the larger pieces. There is no such thing as an island of garbage in the ocean. That does right. not exist. And um, and for some reason, a lot of people still think it does. It's, you know, the big pieces get broken into smaller pieces the size of your fingernail. And it's more like a soup. They're integrated in the ocean. You can't just show up with a net and grab this island and throw it in the back of a freighter and take off with it. It's It's integrated. So you don't get that as much in the Chesapeake because it takes a period of time for that, you know, that plastic to break down and it has to be out there a long time at some level. I don't know how long, but, you know, so anyways, we're, we're going to uh, the top of the bay, the bottom of the bay and the mouths of every river uh, and estuary that we can get into with our boat. And we'll go all the way up the Potomac to Washington, D.C., which is about 25, 26 hours round trip. But the whole thing is to do it essentially nonstop. We will operate through the day and through the night on shifts, uh, three shifts, three hours on, six hours off. And we need to do about 850 miles and we have 10 days to do it. It's fine if you don't have a lot of bad weather. So, it's yeah. you know, it's all if you have three, four days of bad weather, it's going to make it <clears throat> real hard to, to do this. And it's a time sensitive project. There's going to be uh, four scientists on the boat. Um, you know, there's, I got sailors on a boat. We have some camera people on the boat. We're going to try to get a little videos out of this, but you know, we, this is it. This is our 10 days. And regardless of weather or whatever happens, we got to get there and do it. Now we mapped out the Eastern side of the Atlantic garbage patch, 2013. We did some stuff in the Pacific garbage patch, 2014 on our way to Japan. We've done plastics research in the Arctic and the Northwest passage. So it's, it's something we've been continuing to do. Uh, over the years, and we've tried to have projects in the Chesapeake Bay. We've done several of them in the past, um, and it's been a while. Last year was the first time we did a project in the Chesapeake in some years, since like 2015, because uh, we've mm. been mostly focusing on Arctic research. Arctic, you know, these Arctic, yeah. Ex- yeah, a five-month, 
you know, 10,000 mile Arctic research expedition is a lot of planning, logistics, fundraising, and, and so on. A lot yeah, of responsibility a... that, that lies right. on your shoulders when you do that, man. Yeah. I need to get a first Tip mate. Is what I need. Now, by the way, uh, uh, I need to get a first mate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> nudge, nudge, uh, wink, wink. Uh, I I tell first mate. I... <laughs> we'll talk. But... We'll talk about that. Eventually. I think it'd be fantastic to do that. I just, right now I can't, I just can't do it yet, but I know, I but know. it's, it is a lot of responsibility and we don't, I haven't had the funding to hire because the first mate you need to really hire, you know, these are yeah. some professional a lot of work. So I don't even have a first mate most of the time. So it's just me and it all comes down to me. And there's, yeah, there's a lot to deal with and a lot of different dimensions. Um, so anyways, it, it, you know, it's good. We're doing this plastics project. This is something that could be expanded in a lot of places if we, you know, if we wanted to look for it more. And the interesting thing about microfibers versus the, the ocean garbage patches, uh, which are, you know, important to understand what's in the ocean, obviously. But the problem also is that these, these places are thousands of miles offshore. They're places where nobody ever is going to go. They're sort of, it's like the research in the Arctic. It's sort of out of sight, out of mind a little bit. Where with yeah. the microfibers, this stuff is everywhere. I mean, everywhere, everywhere. If you have a lake in your little town, it's in the lake. If you have a river in your town, it's in a river. You know, it's, I just saw an article this morning that something like 40% of the plaque that, that is clogging people's arteries, they found microplastics in the plaque cleaning out people's, you know, cleaning, I mean, doing open heart surgery. How in the hell is it even getting in there? I have no idea. I mean, I, I don't, you know, they have, they have guesses obviously, but you yeah. know, they, I also read something a couple of days ago. That's like for every liter of bottled water that you buy at the store, there's like 240,000 uh, fragments of microfibers and all microfiber fiber fragment is tiny. You won't see it with your eye. But still, right. you buy a bottle of water from the store, and it can have 240,000 of these tiny pieces of plastic in it. They found it in beer. You buy a beer, they've tested beer and found it in that. You know, it, it's so small, it gets through uh. the filtration systems. It's, it gets through everything, and then we end up eating it, you know. And, and then it's got, uh, you know, various chemicals in it that is not good for us. So, and it, mostly on the reproduction side. You know, it's not good for male and female uh, yeah, you know, reproduction. The, As our sperm counts, the their pregnancy, uh, you, know, ba you know, issues with women, you know, birth defects or whatever. Uh, and some of it's BPAs. There's different chemicals. They try to take some out. So like out, the but, forever chemicals, right? That's yeah, a, yeah, yeah. That yeah. category. And some of it we know and we don't know. I mean, this is a situation like we used to, we found out five, six, seven years ago that most of the plastic trash is not on the surface. I mean, a lot of it is. But um, but there's percentage of the plastic trash that's missing anywhere from 70 to 90 percent in some estimates. I, it's very important to still know what's on the surface. It's very important to understand what's going on uh, also on, on, on not just uh, horizontally on the surface, but vertically. And I know yeah. we've talked a little bit. I don't know if you want to get into that. We've talked a little bit about doing some stuff with your next project. Um, I talked to Nicole yeah. about it today, by the way. And Nicole. Oh, seems really? To be all about yeah, she seemed to be optimistic about it. And Nicole's, you know, she's a, she's realistic is what she is because she knows how much work goes in. I mean, it's it's one thing to go out and collect the data. And that's what people see. And that gets like with a lot of citizen science that gets put yeah. in that forefront. What what people don't always think about is that's just the beginning. There's a, a lot of processing that needs to happen. Someone's got to publish a paper, you know, and, and going out and collecting data just for the sake of collecting data doesn't really have much of a purpose. It looks good, and you can present it in a way to the media and the public where they're not going to know the difference. They're going to be like, oh, wow, Jerome Rand, you collected all that plastic stuff. Oh, yes, <laughs> I collected all that. But if you don't process it, and, and, and you're answering a scientific question, a publication right, right. is the answer. Like, what is the question, and what is the result from it? And then you get a peer-reviewed published paper that says, yes, this is the final product. This is what we learned. This is what we discovered. And that's really like all of the work that you would do or I would do or whoever of collecting the data all gets distilled down into that, into the results, into the paper after all the work. So, yeah, I mean, collecting it, uh, we need to have a whole infrastructure in place. We need to have processing lined up uh, and, and obviously publication because at the end of the yeah. day, you know, and, and it's, you know, Nicole, Nicole seems pretty optimistic about it. We'll see how things pan out for what you're going to do. But what I was trying to get at is surface trawling would be great, but it'd also be great to do it vertical at different, different depths. 
obviously you're not going to get down to a thousand feet, but you can still get different depths and it can still be quite important even down to 50 feet or a hundred feet because yeah. so much focus has been on the surface of the, the ocean. And we're starting to, to look more, we can't do the bottom of the ocean. We don't know how much plastic trash is in the bottom of the ocean. We don't know how much it's affecting the fish, for instance. Like there was a guy who went to make a documentary on a, a Midway Island, you know, the famous Battle of Midway. And oh, World War II. with all the plastic the birds are eating down yeah, there and yeah. stuff. Yeah. So he, from what I understand, he wasn't originally making that film. But he got there and he saw these birds doing like, you know, every once every once a year they go to this island. Seabirds still go to an island once a year to have babies. And then they go back out to sea again for the rest of the year. And he's seeing like skeletons with bellies full of plastic, moms feeding yeah, their baby plastic. Dude. And then he made this documentary. I think it's called The Gyre or something like that. It's It's very sad and depressing, as you can imagine. But the yeah. point is that seabirds will go to land to have babies so we can at least have some understanding of how it's affecting them because we can go to that island and see it. We, there is no island where the fish go to have babies. Like we can't, you know, the fish die from a belly full of plastic. They sink to the bottom of the ocean. Maybe they float for a week or something, but eventually they sink to the bottom. There's no way for us to measure what's on the bottom of the ocean in any real way. It's too, no. we don't have the technology, you know, we just, the, the technology just doesn't exist to do it in any real capacity because of the pressure that exists that deep. So there's a lot we still don't know about this issue. There's a lot we don't know about the South Atlantic and South Pacific and Indian Ocean when it comes to the garbage patches. And to isolate and understand the surface uh, plastic is also important to understand where it might be accumulating underwater. You know, it all yeah. is going to tie into each other at some level. So, so yeah, I mean, there's I think there's a there's a decent amount to be done um, in some of the less known uh, gyres, because these are all gyres, right? There's five. There's a nonprofit called Five Gyres. Uh, the the lead scientist is Marcus Erickson. We've been working with him for years, and that the idea is that there are five gyres, and that's where the garbage patches are: North Atlantic, South Atlantic, North Pacific, South Pacific, and Indian Ocean. Indian Ocean. And this yeah. is the these are the garbage patches essentially. But you know, we know very little, uh, or or at least not nearly as much. I mean, the Pacific garbage patch is by far the most researched. The Atlantic garbage patch is second, but um, but there's a lot that could be done. And I think it's, you know, it's important for more and more people to understand uh, how we're interacting with this incredible material. Because at the end of the day, for me personally, it's not that plastic is bad. Plastic is amazing. I mean, the applications in it, the medical applications, the computer that I'm using to talk to you, there's plastic, your car, there's so much possibility within that material. But to make a one-time use item out of a material yeah. that's meant to last hundreds of years is insane, but it's cheap and convenient. And we love cheap and convenient. That's like our favorite thing on earth. We want it cheap and we want it now. We don't want to have to work too hard for it. And so it gets used, this wonderful material gets used in a lot of applications that just don't make a lot of sense. There's biopolymers, there's other ways to create plastics. Just because a plastic is made from a plant doesn't mean it's going to biodegrade any faster. Not necessarily. They can basically reproduce the polymer with a with a plant that they do from oil. Um, but, uh, but at one, least it won't have the chemical, right? Yeah, it won't it's, have. It's, well, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a little bit of both, I suppose. Yeah, because you don't want to have something that'll still last a thousand years sitting in your stomach. Right. But if it's at right. least not giving off these chemicals that are going to be transferred down your genetic line, at least that's, you know, a step in one direction. But yeah, I mean, I see your, your point is the exact same one that I think of as well, where it's just like, we're using a thousand year old, a thousand year product for a 10 second use. And that's so messed up. It'd be so, you know, just, it doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. And it's really changing the mindset of people. I've always thought that things like rules, regulation, government interference, blah, 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 all that stuff, that's not what really needs to happen. It just needs to be a, a, a flip of the switch for people to be like, oh, you know, maybe we shouldn't be using that because that's like stupid. This is our environment. We're really messing it up. Yeah, and it's. It, well, I think the the issue has some hope because, and I don't know if this is going to change. I certainly hope it doesn't, but it's one of the few issues I can think of, or, or at least that we've been involved in, 
that is not politicized. You can be a liberal or a conservative yeah. and you can picture a plastic bottle floating in the ocean and be like, that is bad. That should not be out there. We should do something about this. And so often everything becomes a liberal versus conservative issue, whether it's something like climate change or even the pandemic. We figured out a way to turn a pandemic into a liberal <laughs> versus conservative. Everything yep. goes that way. Ukraine uh -huh. has gone liberal versus conservative. Like everything turns out like, and thank God, this issue, uh, which is a serious issue that we need to address. And we need to address it here on land too, because all plastic is made on land. We use it on land. I'm not a big fan of, of try, you know, these organizations trying to clean the plastic in the ocean. I think it's a waste of time. Um, I think the battle is here on land. We need to, we need to adjust the way that we're interacting with this particular very interesting material, a huge potential, but yeah, we need to change the culture. Ultimately, yeah. And you know how hard it is to change the culture? I mean, that's like one of the hardest things you could ever do. Dude, so, it's, but it's pulling the roots out with the weed. We have to change the mindset. Because, I mean, you know, ideally, like you're saying, if 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 you could just get everybody to be like, oh, dude, I'm, I'm not going to use that. That's like ridiculous. That's going to last a thousand years. Then all of a sudden, the companies that are producing this stuff aren't going to sell it. So they're not going to produce it anymore. And they're going to figure out uh, something that the public will actually utilize and purchase and but that's the that's the the catch is like how do you change the public's perception of using these very convenient products and how do you get them to make that step to be like you know what uh -uh, i'm not doing it anymore that's so dumb yeah and, it, and it, it's important for the public to also understand that we are the ones with the power at the end of the day, yeah, if we can yeah. unite, if we can, if enough of us can unite on any issue, it doesn't matter what it is. Ultimately politicians want to get reelected. Most of them do. I know that girl from that Senator from Arizona is not going to get reelected, whatever her name is, cinema something or other, <laughs> but I that's rare. She got into a lot of trouble because she kind of voted against Democrats, but she's supposed to be a Democrat. Then she's an independent. Anyways, that's abnormal. Most of the time, if you are, a senator, let's say, you want to be reelected until you're like 90 years old, you know, because it's something about power and having power and and all the things that come with that. It's addictive. You know, people don't want to let go of the power. So politicians, if, if they fear that they're not going to get elected because of some whatever it is supporting this or not that they will change their tune to to try to fit what their constituency wants, which could be any situation. It doesn't have to be environmental. It could be anything. And we also can can essentially vote by buying things or not buying things, right? You can yeah. support a company yeah. you believe in, and that's powerful because companies, it's it's an aspect of capitalism, which may not work in the long run, but you need to constantly grow. As a business, you must have a good quarterly statement for your stockholders and da-da-da. So you have to have constant growth, which is impossible. Nothing can grow forever. There is <laughs> eventually that is not gonna work. But but uh you know, we can we can essentially if we can band together, if enough of us can come together, if enough of us realize that we have the power, it's not the government, it's not the politicians, it's not the corporations, it's us, us, the masses, it's the people. But we have to come together. We got to stop fighting over stupid ass shit. Sorry, there's my first swearing. Look how long I made it without swearing. We got to <laughs> stop fighting over stupid ass shit and start coming together, you know, for, for the good of everything, for the good of the country, the good of the environment, the good of our species, you know, and, and, um, but, you know, I don't know. It's it's hard to do that because there's so many mechanisms in place right now that are making people fight people, you know, whether oh, it's yeah. within a yeah, country, yeah. you know, and it's all where well, the good guys, you the bad guys. And, it's, it, you know, and it, it's hard to tell people to stop, you know, stop drinking, uh, stop buying water bottles when every single movie has Fiji water sitting in it in the hand of every freaking star because Fiji pays to have that done. You know, there's right. a lot of there's a lot of people that have a huge incentive to keep on producing this stuff and keep having people use it. But anyway, that that was a great rant. I love it because I think you're you're spot on when it comes to that. And hopefully, hopefully that's that's one of the cool things that might come out of some of this data collection and research and the work that goes into, like you say, publishing and actually having this information about you know the stuff that we're able to go study and actually go and do something we love like sailing to go and study it. And yeah, I think I think for me being able to help in that cause a little bit and be able to take Sparrow on a nice four month trip. Um, 
that's awesome. And I, I think it's, I think it adds a little element to going out and just having a sailing adventure. And hopefully if it does work out and we're able to sort of collaborate on there, um, I think it'd be really cool. It'd be a big honor actually, man. Cause you are, you are, and I'm not trying to blow smoke up your ass. I just swore there. Holy smokes. Uh, but you know, you have been a big inspiration because you may not think of it, but man, you've been putting in year after year after year after year with this non for profit, and it's not easy. And most people, nine times out of ten, probably would have already given up. And you just keep plugging away, and it's really commendable. Well, thanks. I don't know how to give up. I never learned how to give up. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's a good all trait. I know is to, all I know is to keep pushing and pushing and pushing until I die or I accomplish my goal. I mean, that's that's it. But. Uh, but yeah, it would be great, man. Right, now this trip, are you thinking about doing it next year? What's the timeline on your your next big single-handed voyage? Uh, my goal is hopefully to be able to set sail by November of this year. So I have oh, I have okay. speaking stuff and and all this stuff going on for all of March and then April into May. But then by June, I'm headed down to the Carolinas to do work on Sparrow. I'm going to pretty much be down there all summer. Um, so kind of a stone's throw away from the Chesapeake and I don't know, we'll have to see if, if we can make things happen, if we can, uh, collaborate. Cause are you going to be in the Chesapeake all summer? Yeah, it looks like it. We, we're, we're in a situation where we're like a dog chasing our tail in some ways, because, you know, you get back from an expedition in October, you got the boat show. And then by November, we need to start planning the next expedition. And yeah. it's, I need to develop the administrative side of the organization. So at some point in the next couple of months, we need to start trying to bring on an executive director. I just brought on a fundraiser recently. Uh, hopefully, you know, it's sort of a, a trial period for this person and hopefully it works out. Uh, but we need, if we get Ed in this year with a good executive director, a fundraiser, and we really need some more scientific equipment. I need a ideally a multi-beam sonar that it's going to allow us to map down to a thousand meters because one of the things we do is map uncharted fjords to better understand the, the glacier movements over time and give you mm -hmm. a better picture of what's happening it doesn't sound people have a hard time understanding mapping they think you're like looking for oil or something or mining it has nothing to do with that it's not navigation either because why would anybody navigate in a remote fjord nobody ever goes in them but it's yeah. important to understand if you you can't understand what's going on above the water if you don't know what's going on below the water essentially but this multi beam is two hundred and fifty thousand dollars it's uh it's very very expensive so i'm trying to <laughs> yeah i'm trying to get out of this 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 cycle that we're in where you know we can do i could do an expedition this year we could do them but it, we never get past a certain point because we never have anybody there in the administrative role pushing the organization forward when we're gone in the Arctic. If I'm, I, how am I supposed to run a nonprofit when I'm in a remote fjord in Greenland, you know, for five months or something, you know, like, right. how am I supposed to do that? So it, we need to develop the organization. So I'm trying to, to fill in some of these, some of these gaps that in many ways are, are where people would have started. I, I did the organization backwards. I started by going out and proving a track record and, 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 and doing the mission and getting the boat. A lot of people would have started with an out, an office staff first. You get an office, you get staff, yeah, then get the boat. Yeah, but right. I did opposite. I said, we need to get the boat and we need to make a track record of doing the research. And then we can build the other stuff up, you know, once we've gotten this, this the, the mission, basically, or the, the assets for the mission. Now it's time to build up that. So, yeah, I'm going to be around. We might do some more projects in the Chesapeake. It's a great year for us to do collaborative work because I'm not going to be gone all summer in the Arctic like I usually am. So yeah. I will be around to, 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 you know, we can, and it might be good to get your boat here uh, for a little bit. If we want to put like a flow through system for microfibers or, or something like that, we got to engineer a little bit. Um, I don't know. Where's your boat right now? Uh, right now I'm down in Bellhaven, North Carolina. So oh, just okay. in the you're not far. So I'm, yeah, I'm yeah, right you, there. Yeah. Yeah. You're like a few days away or something. You're not very far. I take the, I believe the intercoastal connects right up into the Chesapeake, doesn't it? Uh, it yeah, yeah. It, it pops yeah. out in Norfolk. It pops out the, the end of it or the beginning, depending on how you want to look at it. Well, it's actually mile zero because Key West is yeah. mile like 1215 or something is Key West. So yeah, mile zero is Norfolk. So you come yeah. right out into the bottom of the Chesapeake and then you just work your way up. It's not a big deal. You got to go through that lock uh, or the dismal swamp. If you want to go through the dismal swamp, I don't know if it still Ooh. operates, but 
Yeah, uh, I will, believe it does. Yeah, yeah. It, it will stay in your boat. You you know like that old got milk smile. Those commercials. You get like a you got like a you got like a got yeah, dismal like swamp. Scum. You get like a stain. Yeah, you get a scum stain, like a black stain on your bow from a dismal swamp. You can always tell when somebody went through it and hasn't cleaned it off yet. But yeah, it'd be good. You come up and look. If you're leaving in November, it, are you, we should be we should try to do a talk during the boat show. You, you gonna be around in October? You want to do a final? Uh, yeah, should be. I hey, I definitely I'd be game. I mean, hey, you know, I'm the the speaking stuff is starting to really uh take hold as far as like the the frequency and then the the I mean, I hate to call them the corporate gigs are really the ones that make me able to do like tonight I'm speaking at the public library here in Michigan. Um you know, I like to be able to do talks where they don't have a budget for that. But to be able to do that, you have to have the corporate gigs to be able to, you know, pay for your life, essentially. Um, right. But, yeah, I'd love to. Any Anytime I get invited to do any sort of speaking and stuff, I absolutely always take it up. That'd be super fun to sit on a panel with you, man. That'd be hilarious. Yeah, well, if we can get another person. I mean, I don't want to go crazy with it, but maybe we can do a half day or a day and we can all do something together and we can all do something independently, tell some stories or whatever it is. Yeah, talk, yeah, you know, yeah. Talk sailing tactics. We can grab. I know I'd love to get Randall. We talked about you, me, and Randall Reeves. Yeah, doing it, dude. But, Randall's crazy ass is going to get locked in the ice or something like that. You were saying, I, know, I heard him talking. Know. He's going to go up to Alaska and spend a winter locked in the ice. Cause why not? Crazy, you know, and nobody will hear crazy. about it. This is probably like yeah. the only time anyone's going to hear. Cause Randall's not going to tell anybody. He's just going to go up there and do it. Cause, <laughs> cause, cause that's Randall, you know? So, yeah. but anyways, we'll, we'll definitely keep in touch with that. And we should definitely keep in touch with this plastics thing. It'd be great. Uh, you know, to be able to do something with you. And, and you know, that, that South Atlantic garbage patch is, is not well known. I know when I went through it, I saw a lot of plastic trash for a few days. I ran over a couple of weird big pieces of plastic at night, freaked me out. You said you saw a lot of it when you I went saw through it. The, yeah. Yeah. So it's there and there's just, there's not a huge amount of data on it. There's some, but, but we definitely could use more. There's definitely a publication that could come out that would be important because people should understand that, you know, they don't know much about garbage patches and they think maybe there's just a garbage patch and they still think it's an island. Like there's a lot of misinformation know, out I there. Am. So, you know, anything we can do to, to help further uh, the, the public opinion and these big, crazy single handed trips get a lot more attention than me going up to the Arctic and doing like a proper research expedition, which is fine. I understand it. It's a lot more interesting. So if you can incorporate a cool, crazy, single handed thing with some science, then it's going to really, you know, there's going to be more eyeballs on it, which is just going to help you get it out there more, you know, that, that, yeah. that this, this, these, there's multiple garbage patches. This isn't just an isolated issue in the Pacific, you know, then you can bring in microfibers. You can say it's in the bottled water. You can it's in your backyard. It's all over the place. It's in the plaque when they, they're pulling out of people's hearts. I mean, it's like <laughs> crazy ass stuff. All right. I mean, breathe, breathe, man. Right? Breathe. Yeah. 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 I get, uh, I get excited. Well, and, <laughs> and hopefully, brings attention and brings eyes to the ocean research project so that you guys yeah. start to get really properly funded so that you can make the difference that you're trying to make, which I think, again, very impressive effort that you've done so far. And uh, yeah, I mean, just the, the more help anybody can give you the better. So the more eyeballs, uh, I think that's a great plan. And I, I, like I said, I'm honored to even be considered uh, to possibly be able to help out. So we'll just have to see how it goes and everything. But um, other than that, man, thank you so much for coming on the show. Dude, we'll do a lot of these, I think. You know, you're, yeah, it's, we'll it's always so much around. fun. Yeah, just let me know. I mean, it's, this is easy enough. Like, I know you like doing stuff in person, and I know it's a nice dynamic. I Once in a while, I get to do an interview in person. It's always nice. But, you know, this is our reality, and we have the technology. And I know that it's not as good of audio quality even – but whatever, who gives a shit? Sounds you know, pretty good. Yeah, I'll yeah, I'll uh, I'll send you the audio file. You go ahead and post it on your podcast if you if you like it. Go ahead, do it sure. whenever you want. It doesn't matter to me. Um, but yeah, thanks for coming on the show. And yeah, uh, absolutely, until next time, dude. All right, thanks for having me, man. Appreciate it. Yep.